All right, we're going to continue with the kinetic theory of gases. <clears throat> so, to introduce the material, um, more or less, the, the kinetic theory of gases starts by treating gases as point particles and then looking at how they collide with each other. There's some slight modifications if you have a molecule. Um, and, and then we consider that you also, when we talk about specific heat, you can also get um, vibrations of the molecule. Um, <clears throat> in a gas, the separation between atoms and molecules is much larger than what you would get if you had um, if you had atoms bound in a molecule. So um, so much much larger than you know, nanometers. Um, <clears throat> And in this case, you can treat the interactions between individual gas particles as weak. Um, and the property, the properties of the gas then depend more <laughs> on the number of atoms or molecules per unit volume and on the temperature than on the type of the atom um, or, or molecule, with some dependence on whether it is on the type of molecule. Um, so in in this case, we're basically treating them like point particles. You actually can derive the ideal gas law, which we're going to talk about, from something called statistical mechanics, where you just look at large systems containing a lot of gas molecules. So an example of applications is thinking about what happens with pressure when you are adding air, for instance, to a tire. Um, at first, when you add air, the, um, the tire inflates, but it does not change the pressure very much. And then you are adding pressure. And then at some point, as you keep pumping, you're changing the pressure and the temperature. Um, so in this case, you're changing the volume. In this case, you're changing the um, you're changing the pressure, but not changing the volume much. All right, so the ideal gas law was originally derived basically by looking at data and trying to figure out how to make sense of the properties of gases. So here you can see data from, um, <clears throat> from Robert Boyle's original paper the volume versus the in one over the pressure. So this is actually a common technique used, especially in early days in chemistry, that if you don't know, um, if you don't know the law describing something, you just start plotting variables versus each other and look for <clears throat> some straight line, see if you can infer what the dependence is. So this, um, these data, tell us that the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure. So somehow, however a gas behaves, um, the volume is some constant divided by the pressure. And in this case, this was kept at constant temperature. And this shows the volume versus the temperature. Um, and from this, you can infer, bear with me while I fight with Zoom. From this, you can infer that the volume is proportional to the temperature with some different constant of proportionality. So <clears throat> then if the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure and proportional to the temperature, then you get something like this, um, where C is just some other constant. I just didn't want K double prime. And again, this is actually showing, this is from data showing the volume versus temperature. And you just fit a straight line. You see it follows a straight line. All is good. Now, we're going to want to add, <coughs> before we actually put this all together, so you can see between those two, you get some you get something really close to the ideal gas law. You can talk about how gases volume depends on both temperature and on pressure. But we want to we want some way of quantifying how much gas we have. So we're going to use a quantity called a mole. <clears throat> 
which is six point am I confusing? I have messed up a digit here, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 um, atoms or molecules. This is called Avogadro's number. Um, and we call that many um, atoms or molecules a mole. Um, so it's just a constant number of particles. Technically, a mole is unitless. It's just a number, but we do often keep treat it like a unit, a mole, um, because it is useful to keep track of it and see where it cancels out. You actually already have seen something like this. The um, when we use radians, radians are technically unitless, but we often treat them as if they um, were a unit, um, so that we don't lose track of it. So a mole is an awful lot of particles. So if you had 6.022 times 10 to the 23 tennis balls, it would cover the earth to a depth of 40 kilometers, which is really thick. So a mole is a lot, but gas molecules are small. Um, so there's a lot of gas molecules <laughs> in a mole. And then we get the ideal gas law. And most of you have probably already encountered this in a, um, in a high school class, PV equals NRT. Um, and then if we look at each of the individual parts, this is the pressure, um, the SI units of pressure are Pascals. This is the volume, the SI unit is meters cubed. Um, this is the number of moles. and it's technically unitless. Um, and this is in SI units, 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. And this is the temperature, and this is very important. The temperature has to be in Kelvin, not Fahrenheit, not Celsius, but Kelvin. Now, sometimes if you do something and you're looking at a difference in temperatures, you can get away with not converting to Kelvin um, and just leave it in, um, in a change in degrees Celsius. But be careful because this does actually rely on, um, on everything being in Kelvin. And actually, if we go back here, historically, what was on the axis here was, um, degrees Celsius, which would mean that the um, zero was here um, and you actually had an intercept, but you could extrapolate back to where you reached a temperature of zero. Okay, so this is our ideal gas law. Um, it is incredibly useful. This might be one of the few pieces of the, the few pieces of physics knowledge that I use in my life outside the classroom and the lab the most. Um, <clears throat> when you're thinking about, say, what happens to the tires when the season to your tire pressure when the season changes? Well, the volume of your tire stays roughly constant. The temperature goes down, so the pressure goes down. So this is why you usually have to. In, to inflate your tires in the fall, um, even if you didn't, um, even if nothing happened to them to lead to, to air leaking out. So ideal gas law, incredibly useful. It's also one of the things that I've talked about with my kids, comes up incidentally. Um, we're a very geek, geeky household. Well, why does this do this? Well, let me tell you, son, about the ideal gas law. Now, the ideal gas law is an approximation. It works very well when the separation between atoms or molecules is large compared to um, the size of these atoms or molecules. And when the pressure, that also means when, um, that means corresponds to when the pressure is low. Um, 
And when the volume density is also low, then the ideal gas law works. <clears throat> this is the Van der Waals equation. Um, and it, is, it has some slight corrections to the ideal gas law. So in the ideal gas law, you would set these constants equal to zero to get the ideal gas law. <clears throat> and actually there should be an N there or it's assumed that you're talking about a mole. Uh, oh, it says molar volume. Okay, so that's where they slipped the moles in is, the, is declaring that this is the molar volume. So then um, <clears throat> what happens in this case is that you get some slight corrections um, and you can, it actually does pretty well um, but it's not perfect. And you can even see deviations from this as you go to um, in extremely low pressures or volumes. Um, <clears throat> so um, here you can see these are not quite, so the, um, these are not quite the same as on the previous equation. And sometimes you have to worry, for instance, as soon as you have uh, a liquid forming from your gas because of the, the properties of that liquid or of that material, then you no longer can follow an ideal gas law because you don't have the gas. Um, <clears throat> so then what you often show are isotherms that to tell you what's going on. That means iso means constant. Um, so an isotherm is a constant temperature, a line of constant temperature. Um, and then you, um, you can draw where these sit. If you are, um, if you are dealing with a gas, if you are at reasonably high densities and pressures, then this looks more or less like, um, like the pressure goes with one over volume, but as you go to, um, <coughs> as you go down, so this corresponds to higher pressure or lower um, volume per unit per mole, um, you're going to end up distorting the shape more. Um, and this, this part just zooms in on that. So here, this one you would generally call an ideal gas. Here you have, a, it's a really a gas, but it isn't quite ideal because you do have to consider the interactions between the molecules. And then, and then as you go lower, you get different effects that you have to consider like phase changes. So how does this work microscopically? <clears throat> If you have a molecule in, in some, in a molecule of gas and it collides with a wall, um, <clears throat> the momentum, um, the momentum of the molecule changes, but the fact that the, <clears throat> the molecule changed direction, you, it, the, the molecule is exerting a force on the wall and pressure is force per unit area. So the fact that these collisions occur is what is what leads to the force, what leads to the um, the pressure from the gas. So if you have an entirely closed container, um, the molecules can't escape, and um, on average, the molecules of gas are going to push on the um, are going to push on on the wall. And you also can have, so there's in a typical gas, the, the molecules move extremely fast. So they have billions of collisions every second in, in say the gas molecules in a room, um, but you still can have trends. So this is for instance, how you hear a sound wave that for a sound wave, you are on average, you will have motion of molecules generally um, you actually have a pressure wave inside of the gas. So you, there's a preferred direction in general for the molecules in the gas. Um, and in this case, the sound wave is transmitted at speeds relative to, or, well, which are related to the molecular speeds. Um, we then can talk about specific heat. So for an object, which is 
absorbing energy, the, um, the amount of energy absorbed is typically the mass or some measurement of the quantity um, times the specific heat um, times the change in temperature. Um, and here, if you write it for your amount of gas, instead of writing the mass, you're gonna write the number of moles then it turns out that your specific, you can write your specific heat in terms of the ideal gas constant. Um, so for, uh, for a monatomic gas, um, you will al always have a specific heat of three halves times the, times the gas constant. Um, and then it actually changes if you have um, if you have more complicated molecules. So for a diatomic gas, as you go up in temperature, at some point you have enough energy in the system that you are exciting. So when you are at low temperatures, you're you are just treating these gas molecules like balls. So they are totally rigid balls, and even if they're in a molecule, they can't move. <clears throat> um, and then um, here, when you get to enough uh, a slightly higher temperature, you can get translational kinetic energy. So you're actually getting the gas molecules moving between each other um, and so you can end up with these guys moving uh, so the entire molecule can can start moving together and then at the very highest when you're starting to i'm not drawing very good pictures so maybe i'll just give up on the pictures i was never an artist when you get to the vibe the highest temperatures you actually start exciting the vibrational modes so that the molecule um, the two hydrogens in this case are rotating relative to each other so what you see is that the specific heat of the gas actually does depend on the temperature um, in these cases and that also can tell you something about the properties of the gas um, this is relating the number of um, so back here, this relates the specific heat to the number of what we call degrees of freedom, which is the number of ways that a molecule can, can move. So when you have something that can only move translationally, it has fewer degrees of freedom than if it can start rotating um, relative to itself. Uh, so that in that case where the hydrogen atoms can move relative to each other. Um, and this you also can relate to specific heat if you, for instance, talk about solids. Um, so if you have a solid, for instance, in a crystal, you can model it as attached to all of the neighboring um, particles by a spring. And then um, you can have motion in the direction of each spring. And that corresponds to, uh, um, that corresponds to, there's three directions it can move. Um, and then there's one um, degree of freedom for potential energy, one, one for kinetic energy. Um, ah, sorry, each of the two directions has two degrees of freedom because it can move either towards one atom or the other. All right, relating these to temperature or speed. Um, <clears throat> so, we talk when we talk about gases um you're talking about a very large number of particles so you're not measuring individual particles you can talk about the distribution of um for instance velocities of those particles and on average they're going to have a particular speed but they also have a broad distribution um, and that distribution is given by something called the maxwell boltzmann distribution um and the most likely speed is usually going to be less than the RMS speed. And the, sorry, RMS stands for root mean squared. <laughs> what the RMS means is that really you take the mean squared 
so the average velocity squared, and then you're taking the square root. This is not quite the same thing as the average velocity, but it is a measure of the average velocity. And your root mean squared um, velocity is going to be larger than the most likely value because of this extremely long tail. Um, so if you have a gas, you're all, almost always going to have some stuff sitting in that very long tail. That's important to remember because you have to, uh, because sometimes you're, you're concerned with um, what happens to that tail. So for instance, if you ever use evaporative cooling, in evaporative cooling, um, you have water um, and you might, for instance, you might use a swamp cooler, you blow water, uh, blow a fan across the air. When that happens, you are, um, the water molecules that escape are disproportionately the higher um, velocity water molecules, so you lose those. And what happens is that then the average um, velocity, which corresponds to, which is related to the average temperature, decreases. So this distribution, the fact that you actually have a distribution is very important. And, um, and it helps you understand some things that you guys may have seen before. So we live in Tennessee. You may have seen a swamp cooler. They're, they're going out of vogue now because air conditioners are so readily available, but this used to be what you would use when, before before we really had air conditioning. It still works wonderfully. Um, all right, and then what happens is that as you go to higher temperatures, the distribution is shifted upwards, so that the the temperature is related to the average um, the average velocity. All right, and we are going to stop there, and we'll see you guys next time.